Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Monday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joy Elkanen and Dennis Dick back from uh, his bachelor party. Well, he survived, which is the good news. So he's going to regale us with tales of that when we, when we bring him on in a few minutes. But we have some movers to discuss. The theme in the morning, of course, the big headline that the trade war is on pause for now with China. So we're going to talk about the um, the market's reaction to that on the upside, on the downside. Uh, every which side we have a couple of other individual movers to discuss as well. The retail earnings will continue this week, so we'll get through a couple of those. If we have time, our guest this morning at 835 is Kirk Duplessis. He is the founder and head trader at Option Alpha. And again, he'll join us at 835. Joel, how's it going this morning? And the S&Ps were up, I imagine. Up, up and away. No trade war today. Spoo's up 15 uh, opened higher, uh, jaunted up to 27.36 and a quarter. Not a big number to me. Last week's high, 41 and a quarter. That's a big hurdle on the upside. On the downside, you sold off a little bit to 24 and a quarter. That took it into yesterday's range, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, below that, uh, not too much until uh, the close of 13. Uh, moving on to uh, Bitcoin futures, trading up two hundred and seventy-five dollars at eighty-five hundred. We didn't. We didn't. Uh, oh yeah, we did talk about the big Bitcoin conference uh, in New York. Crude up seventy, up four cents at seventy-one forty-one. We did sneak over seventy-two dollars. Gold well under thirteen hundred, down seven bucks at twelve eighty-four twenty, and silver down a nickel at sixteen. 40. Uh, Dennis, you're back. You survived. Could you give us one highlight from what are two highlights from your weekend in Nashville? Well, I don't know if I can give you any highlights, but happens in Nashville stays in Nashville, right? <laughs> no, it was, uh, I, there was some highlights, low lights. Um, the, the biggest low life or, uh, you know, biggest issue that i had and i'm in really rough shape here guys because i can't keep up with these young bucks here anymore but biggest issue is that i spent a lot of time at the airline terminal in nashville yesterday so most of the guys drove down because they were cheap it's actually a 15 hour drive because uh, most of the guys were coming from north of toronto um and i decide i'm not driving in a car 15 hours with a bunch of guys so i decided to fly in so i flew in a little bit later i flew in on the friday uh, morning and then um uh, I was flying out Sunday morning. So my flight was scheduled to depart Nashville at 11 a.m., land in Toronto because of the time change and stuff. I think it was supposed to land just before 3 o'clock in Toronto. And I, we get on the plane. Everything is good. So I get to the airline around 9 o'clock for my 11 o'clock flight. I get there nice and early because international. I didn't know if I'd have any issues. And um, we get on the plane like 10 30 or you know right before it's going we're boarded we're getting ready to go but it's hot on the plane i'm feeling okay it's hot um and they're saying okay the air conditioner is not working but they're working on fixing it so we sit on the plane for about 20 minutes they can't fix it so they make us uh they, they make us all get off the plane get your bags get off the plane because we got to fix the air conditioning so we get delayed for an hour sit there you know waiting for air. they get delayed another hour finally they determine they can't fix the air conditioning so they have to fly another jet in to come and get us. And I wasn't on like a major U.S. airline. I was on a Cana small Canadian West jet airline. So there's no other plane there. So they they fly. Their, their intent is to fly another plane down from Toronto to come and pick us up. So which is cool. I mean, that's, you know, I've been stranded before where they just say, OK, you got to hop on, you know, the next plane and you're basically on standby here. So it was cool that they were sending a whole other plane to get everybody. So they send that plane down, but it wasn't coming for another five hours. So I'm like, oh boy. So anyway, so you get delayed and then it gets to the plane lands. Well, don't you know, by that time a storm has rolled in. So it's lightning and thundering and we're getting delayed here again. So it's 5.30, 6.30. Finally at 6.30, I guess they get a break and we caught a break and they allow us to board the plane. Then we're sitting out there, it seems like forever, because they're probably trying to get the green light so they can actually take off because they won't take off in lightning. 
So finally, we get the green light, take off, ends up being almost an eight hour delay. So I was at the Nashville airport from 9 a.m. till basically 7 p.m., 10 hours there, just at an airport. I was honestly starting to feel like Tom Hanks in Terminal. <laughs> I thought maybe I'm going to have to, you know, camp out here in the corner. I don't know what's going to happen, especially when it starts storming. I'm like, and I'm looking at the radar. I'm online. I'm like, this storm might be settling in here. It wasn't really moving fast. It wasn't like a quick, you know, thunder shower through. It's like there's storm clouds everywhere going here. I think I could be here for the night. So anyways, it worked out, got back in. So I didn't get in now tell my home because I flew in Toronto, then I got to drive up. And the funny thing is, is that those guys drove and I had, and, and my cottage is about an hour and a half from Toronto. So I had a ride arranged to, uh, you know, to come up to Toronto. I canceled that because I texted with those guys. The guys that drove the 15 hour trip actually almost beat me. They were literally only uh, 20 minutes away when I finally landed in Toronto. So they just picked me up and drove me home. So I got a ride with them for the last hour and a half. So uh, it all worked out though. I'm here safe. I'm back. I'm on the show. I didn't have to miss Monday trading, which I was starting to worry about too, if I got stranded in Nashville overnight. So I'm back in the saddle, ready to go, Joel. Yeah. And uh, you also, uh, you had lunch with our buddy. We did. And that was great. Jeremy Newsome, awesome guy from real life trading. He, I believe he's going to be on the show on Thursday, Joel. Is it Thursday uh -huh. what I'm scheduled for? Let's see, Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday or Thursday. So Jeremy's coming on. Great guy. He's got a you know a great little trading. You know he's right in the options. Thursday. Um, similar to Nick Shaheen style types of trades. Uh, a lot of covered calls. A lot of doing a lot of things. But we were just talking strategy and talking you know different uh, you know trading tactics and stuff. And man, I tell you, he is a great guy. Went out to a, a great little barbecue place in Nashville. There. He's been living in Nashville down there for six years. He loves it down there. And you know he's he's just got a nice little uh, business there too. He's got a great chat room there too so we'll be on the show or he'll be on the show thursday and tell you all about it all right let's get uh, to the markets here and uh we have some uh let's start with ge that's a stock that we talk about that uh finally has got some good news uh let's get the news on ge and see how it's traded yeah well they, this was a report from uh, on, on sunday that uh, it was made official this morning that they are spinning off their transportation unit with uh wabtec and they're merging those two companies into one combined entity uh so wabtec uh is going to uh, or sorry ge is going to receive uh 2.9 billion dollars in cash and own a majority uh, stake, 50.1% of the new entity. Uh, Wobtech will own the, the rest, the other 49.9%, but $2.9 billion going into GE's pockets for this merger. The one thing this tells me as a shareholder is that there is some value in individual GE businesses. We know, you know, they've got some issues. We know that, but you know, here you are, one business, and they're going to sell, and there's still ten billion dollars there, and they got a lot of different businesses there. So you start breaking up, start thinking about it. There is some value here, and maybe that's the way to do it. Maybe it's to break up this huge conglomerate that's all over the place and start breaking it up in its own individual businesses and extract the value that way. So I, I applaud the, the deal when I saw it on on Sunday. You know, when it was rumored, I don't know if it's official yet, but I was like, that's the smart way to go about it. Shareholders are plotting here this morning as it is official, and the stock is trading up 2.3%. So nice lift here for General Electric. I like that. Um, Spencer, what are your thoughts? This is getting you back to even. Yeah, back to even. No, I, I mean, <laughs> I had the same thing, the same thought that you had is, uh, you know, we always we always assume that there is value in GE's uh, many, many individual businesses. So this just confirms that. So how much more will they spin off? I don't know. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, and maybe that's the way you got to do it. So of um, stock straight up 1530, Joel, what we got now is the technicals. It does look like a technical breakout here. It's not a huge lift for the stock. I mean, but it is a nice lift. A I mean, the S&Ps yeah. are trading up substantially as well. So you can make the argument that G was probably going to be up, you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 anyway. So they're not really giving it much of a premium for that. But that being said, uh, stock is still trading up. It is. It's trading in the green, trading over fifteen dollars at fifteen thirty-one. Uh, I was looking at the daily charts, and you did have a pop to fifteen thirty-three. Uh, that was on March twelfth, and then it kind of really withered away after that. So we traded right up there in the pre-market. We're holding right up there. So we're. I don't know if we back off. I don't know. I still think you're going to find buyers. Um, 1510 fills the gap from uh, Friday. So be buyers above 15, 1510, 1511. If you're looking for a gap fill uh, on the dailies, maybe you have to start just thinking about, you know, $16 now. 
Um, I see 1552, 1534, 1563, but you know, maybe some size at the half number, 15. Size everywhere, Joel. Yeah, there is. It's hard. That's your biggest issue when you get, you know, big companies like this, you know, that are widely held, widely followed, very liquid. The book is so thick. But that being said, there's a lot of volume here too. 254,000 shares, but you know, just looking for fun at the book, 68,000 at 15 and a quarter, 75,000 at 15, 35, 50,000 at 15, 40, 200,000 at 15, 50, 20,000, 30,000, 60,000, 15, 69, 62,000, 15, 75, 180,000, another two point or two, uh, 260,000 at 16. It's just a lot of big orders in there. Can take it out, but it's, you know, tough study. You just got it. It's thick. So it takes a lot of money to really push the price up through there. What it really takes is a big institution to come on board and say, I want to come in here and really be long G on this news and buy it. And if that doesn't happen, if you don't have an institution that's going to make that, it's hard for retail to drive it up that much because it just takes so much money to push it through it. What I mean by retail, you know, obviously institutions but retail as well indirectly, but the direct retail traders can push price around. We've been talking about that. On a stock like G, it's harder because the book is so thick. And uh, also, these institutions, they don't buy it on good news like this. They maybe scalp out of some. On the, yeah, they scalp out of some on the long side. Yeah, institutions, they were down there with the stock was at 13 bucks. You know, you had all those lows under 13. I believe uh, 12 and change was the low of the move. That's when they're buying. They, you know, here they're. Well, that's when you hope they're buying. I bet you there was a lot buying higher than that, too, though. <laughs> uh, but so no. some of the lucky institutions, I bet you there's not a lot that bought the lows at 13. I bet you there was a lot that was in earlier than that, too, though. So I know we're giving the institutions a lot of credit, but a uh, fun statistic for you, and not saying, you know, you shouldn't be with funds, but it's something like 80% of uh, institutional funds, so fund managers, underperform the S&P, 80%, so four out of five. Is that a, Have you heard that stat before, Spencer? It's hard to beat the market. Well, I have heard that stat before, yes. Yeah, I think it's four out of five fund managers in the long run underperform the market. That's hard, it's hard. I mean, beating the market is very difficult. That's why ETFs have come so much into favor. That's why you see a lot of indexing happening where people don't want to see, you know, an underperformance, if they're, especially if they're paying 2 3% a year to manage your money. You definitely don't want to see an underperformance. You want to see them beating at least by 2 or 3%. And it's difficult. It's difficult to consistently beat the market. So we give some institutions credit. I mean, some are smart. And, you know, and a lot of these guys are very smart. It's just difficult to consistently beat the, the market, especially with the big money that they're playing with. Because their you know, whole thing is, you know, when you're moving in, and you know, Joel, when you're moving in, you know, a couple hundred million, million dollars in a stock, especially, you know, if you're talking some of these billion dollar funds, you're going to move the price. So, you know, they're already kind of down before they start because of the price impact issues. Now, it's a different story when you got some of these hedgies that are widely followed. Obviously, you know, they, you know, then get the lift because, um, you know, that's disclosed that they own it. But, you know, because Fidelity owns something or Templeton owns something, there's no lift at all when that gets disclosed that they bought something. It's when Warren Buffett bought something or Bill Ackman or Carl Icahn. So, you know, they don't get that lift. Plus, they have the price impact issues. So they're already behind the eight ball before they start. So it's maybe what, you know, other reasons why they might underperform the market in the long run. It's funny. Lots of issues there. Yeah, it's funny, uh, you know, you're talking about indexing because uh, uh, Jack Bogle made it on the cover of Barron's. Uh, still battling uh, Jack Bogle, the father of index investing, defends his invention against a growing chorus of critics. So uh, that is your stock picker. I mean, that's one, I mean, one great quality you have. It's one, you know, I've, I've been a little, you know, I've been in the markets longer. I've probably been a little bit more toward, you know, the indexing and on a lot of things. And it's just like, you know, it, it just beats the market. And it, I mean, you do your homework. And, and your long-term investment portfolio. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, exactly. And, uh, and I do have some index funds in my long-term investment portfolio. I own the Qs. I own the SPY. I own a lot of Canadian because I'm Canadian. So I lot of, own a lot of Canadian that index funds. So I do still do it. Uh, but, you know, I like to have fun with the stock picking my investment portfolio as well. So I would still say two-thirds of my investment portfolio is individual stocks. But I, I can't argue with you. And, and Trading, investing, two completely different animals. I've always said, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good trader. As a long-term investor, you know, I make calls and some are going to be right, some are not going to be right. GE was not one of my not right calls in my long-term investment portfolio. I've had other good ones too. So I don't know. I, I, 
it's a hard thing. Like I almost, you know, you should try to figure out, you know, how you're doing your long-term invest portfolio, but I've never like actually figured out, you know, my annual returns or anything like that. Um, you know, you're I could, you could easily do you it. Know, Dennis, but... You're emotionally attached to GE. That's why you I, well, I know I you saw are. half of it last you year. You are, because you <laughs> traded it for a couple years uh, scalping. I made a lot of money trading yeah, GE in and it's just like you just want to be in the game. You don't I have care. to have a little piece. It's, it's in my heart there. You I got to have a little piece of G. It's like down to like 0.5% of my invest portfolio. <laughs> so 0.5%. So it's very small. And the main reason for that is it's come down. I bought, I was in a 30. <laughs> and I was in a 30 from years ago. I was in it for like 15 years. You're a trader. a dog. You're a trader. You got to have something to complain about. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I'll complain about my GE. <laughs> uh, Fuzzy's being patient here. And, yeah, sure. Uh, he, he wants to know about PGX. And uh, this is power shares this preferred. Is preferred yeah. stocks. Hmm. Bunch of them out there. This is just a pure dividend play. So 5.83%. You're coming in these. You can think of, there's all kinds of other ones like there too, like PFD. Yep. That's one that I've owned in the past. That's got a 6.98% dividend. These own preferred stocks. And preferred stocks, if you don't know what a preferred stock is, it's just a hybrid between a bond and a stock. So basically, if you go in the packing order and the company goes to default, preferred shareholders get paid before common shareholders. But that's pretty much it. They're in it for the dividend, and that is it. Preferred stock and dividends are treated differently than bonds do. Um, in Canada, you get a tax break. U.S. is a little bit of a tax break, I think, as well. So preferred dividend is, in, is treated differently than an interest payment. So it's all it is, a hybrid security basically between a bond and a stock in the middle. And it's basically, it trades more like a bond that will trade more with interest rates. So as the TLT comes down, you're going to see preferred stocks come down. If you put the TLT portfolio on top of that PGX, uh, chart if you put the uh, the TLT chart on top of the PGX chart they kind of somewhat look similar so you know obviously there's individual performances you know and maybe they got some good preferreds bad preferreds but overall it's going to track interest rates if interest rates are going higher that is bad for preferred stocks because obviously there's alternatives and you know your yields are not as attractive there for the same reason bonds aren't as attractive if interest rates are going lower preferred stocks become more in favor Right now, preferred stocks are kind of out of favor because we are in a rising interest rate environment. At least, you know, um, we have been in a rising interest rate environment. Sounds like they're getting a little bit more dovish than they were hawkish on the last quarter. But, you know, if you look at the utility stocks, it was the same way. XLU has not had a good month here either. So it's been going down as well. But I like preferred stocks. So, you know, I, I don't know PGX. I've never traded PGX myself. I think it's a little more thin one. I have owned PFD a lot of times. There's a couple. There's a PFO one I think as well, um, which I've owned a few times too. Um, there, I think actually I still own PFO in my investment portfolio. And then there's individual preferred stocks, all kinds of them. Like I talked a long time about the Dillard's one that I had in my portfolio forever, DDT. That's a nice little yielder. Yield 7.36 percent. You've got the Dillard stock up at eighty dollars, telling me that that preferred dividend is fairly safe. If Dillard started getting killed, I might be concerned, but there it just sits there and continues to pay 7.36% on your money, DDT. So another preferred stock for you there. Uh, real thought here for thoughts on um, Oshkosh holding. Uh, Terry Kern is asking about that. And uh, that's a pretty good looking chart there. Uh, several up days in a row. I'm looking at Friday's high is 77.37. What sticks out like a sore thumb? 77.50. That was your high on April 26. Uh, above 77.50, things really open up into the 80 handle. But uh, first things first, let's take out 77.50. Nice, slow, steady rally. Uh, Dennis, any thoughts on uh, oh, Oshkosh? By gosh, they make over. I haven't bought a pair of overalls in a while, but they make other things, right? It's on the comeback trail. You kind of had where it got murdered. Kind of had the, you know, the breakdown through 70, became a fake down reverse that day. Had a green candle, close stronger that day. That was the turning point. And now it's kind of been straight up for seven, eight days. Does it feel like you're chasing it now? Kind of. Does it have room to 80? Yes. But I kind of feel like you're in the middle of nowhere because it's kind of gone too far for me to chase it here now. And I see overhead supply up at 80. Could there be a day trade in it? Could, could trend continue? Sure. I think there is room to 80 on this thing. You know, barring news. I don't know if there's news coming out because I'm not following the company that closely. But uh, technically speaking, I think there's room to 80, but you're coming in the trade for the last two, three bucks. I feel like you're a little late to the party now. Uh, thoughts on crude for jazz here. Uh, just a real stealth rally in crude over the last couple. Actually, in April, uh, you made a low at $62. You've uh, or actually $63. You've tacked on $10 here. 
I'm just looking at the short term pattern here. We got a boost overnight over 72. So you got a double top up here at 72. Your May 15th high was 72. The high last night was 72.01. So right there, that's your resistance string is 71.38. I'm, I'm going to give 71 my level on the downside if I'm trying to lock into some profits here. The current low, 71.32. Uh, Friday's low 109 and Thursday's low 107. So uh, need to hold 71 and uh, major resistance is 72. Uh, Dennis, I want to say some. Uh, first off, uh, our apologies. Uh, Jar has reminded us in the chat that today is Victoria Day. So happy Victoria Day. I, I'm supposed to have the day off. Uh, I needed it. <laughs> I'm hurting. I'm hurting here today, and, guys. And he's asking if Victoria Day has any impact on stocks. I doubt it, but I want to no. wish you a happy Victoria Day. The other way around, yes. Us. So U.S. markets, you know, you, you know, sorry, Canadian listeners, but the U.S. markets seem to dominate North American trading. So U.S. markets usually don't care too much. The Canadian markets aren't open. Canadian markets absolutely care that the U.S. markets aren't open. So if you look actually back into next Monday, which is not a holiday in Canada, but is a holiday obviously in the US, you'll have quiet trading on Toronto because the US markets are closed. I don't expect to see quiet trading in the US because the Canadian markets are closed. Sorry about that Canadian listeners, but US markets dominate still. Um, and anyway, obviously today we've got the huge rally going on. And what are we attributing today's rally? There's no trade war here now. Is that what? That's correct. It, I saw multiple headlines coming from when I was sitting in the terminal for 10 hours and reading my Twitter account for 10 hours. That'll look like uh, the trade wars. Looks like it's over, at least for now. Well, the, it's on pause for now. Mnuchin was just on CNBC, I think. He said there's still there's still issues to work out as far as NAFTA is concerned, but uh, uh, they've made progress and they're they're putting the trade war on pause. So nothing matters. <laughs> so interesting stock trading action from this. Um, obviously, the market overall is applauding it. You can see up significantly here. Even stocks like Boeing trading up. Um, but if you look, a lot of your Chinese stocks are really trading up on this news as well. Alibaba is trading up over $3 here in the pre-market. Uh, you were pointing out a few other Chinese stocks that were trading up, Spencer. But it looks like, you know, that Chinese stocks are definitely a source of strength this morning. Baidu is up almost $4 here in the pre-market. Uh, you can go to some of the smaller ones like WB, Weibo. It's trading up 1.75%. Um, Momo is another one that I had in my investment portfolio for a while. Wish I would have held on to it. I sold it, and it's still continuing to go higher. Forty dollars and sixty-five cents. It's up two percent. That's a breakout for Momo. M O M O had been struggling at the forty-dollar level for a while, Joel, and it's consolidated station there for a while now, and now it's looking like it's itch it's itching to go there too. So Momo uh, looking okay. Yeah, I mean it's just news, you know. It uh, these stocks, the China on again, off again thing. I mean. Just, uh, you know, pay attention to, uh, you know, what may comes out on Tuesday and Wednesday or Thursday, uh, something on the negative side. I mean, it's really this market, absent of negative headlines, you know, moves higher. And uh, this is kind of like a, a negative, you know, a positive headline that there's not a trade war. So that's it, man. I mean, that's what's moving us and uh, 15 points overnight. You just wonder if there's much more meat on the bone here on the rally but uh hard to fade the news overnight got the higher open continue in that direction and holding the gains overnight also and if nxpi yeah. nxpi and qualcomm too uh tr both, tr both right out. because they had the potential deal in chinese uh, it was obviously worried that they weren't going to approve any type of merger that was going to happen there and if they you know trade wars getting lighter here maybe yeah. that deal has more potential to get approved now correct if it does go through so that's a good point there spencer too i also want to bring up u.s steel because we know u.s steel was actually benefiting from the potential of a trade war and tariffs. And you're going to see some of these other stocks, you know, maybe think some of the solar stocks, you know, that were showing some benefits. There's going to be some implications there. U.S. Steel is down significantly on this news now. It is trading down 1.8% here in the pre-market. So that's a pretty good fall here for X. So keep in mind, some of the steel stocks could be a little bit weaker on this because they were looking forward to potentially some tariffs to protect their U.S. businesses, obviously, and that might not happen as much. So uh, think about that if you're trading those today. That is why U.S. Steel is trading down here in the pre-market. Yeah, we were trying to think of other stocks. Um, that what, wasn't there some solar action off of this, too? And I don't see anything here this morning, really. But wasn't there a couple of solar companies, some of the smaller ones that were going to benefit from this? Remember Gordon Johnson? He was talking about you know tariffs and stuff, too. And then there was the big thing there. I, I, I don't see any of the, of, the, of the solar stocks trading down on this. So you know, I, 
And I and again, that would be a Gordon Johnson question more than you know a Dennis yeah. Dick question here this morning because he followed it so much closely. But there was a couple stocks in the steel sector that I thought could potentially be impacted by this as well. What about the Chinese uh, steel well, stock? CSIQ someone... indicated upward. I don't know. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. it's tra- trading up. Yeah, First know. Solar is trading up a little bit too, at least bit up here this morning. So. I think the ones that really jump out at you, like the first thing I thought was U.S. Steel is probably going to be weaker on this, and I brought it up, and it was. So not surprising that U.S. Steel is trading down. Uh, but, um, you know, I, we don't know. Like, it's not – it's saying the trade war, it looks like it's, you know – but we don't know if it's right over here or not. So another headline could break tomorrow, and something could be back on. So still headline risk here if you're trading these. But market is applauding it overall. Uh, out of the uh, Google YouTube chat, uh, questions on uh, Micron here. And I'm not seeing any major news. They are having uh, an investor day here, trading yes, up a buck twenty-one at fifty-four sixty. Uh, you know, maybe looking for some good news coming out of this investor day. Big level on the upside, folks, uh, is uh, fifty-six fifty. Um, you hit uh, well. You got a couple highs in the fifty-six handle. I will just look at uh, the. Well, let's just look at Friday's high because that's still two bucks away. Uh, Friday. I'm sorry. Friday's high was fifty-four. 65 Two days ago. Thursday's high 56 yeah. and a half. So a little bit of uh, perhaps enthusiasm here for investors day coming back on the downside. You have a, a very good support level uh, just under $53. You had three lows there last week. So 53 is your support 56 and a half your resistance in Micron here on their investor day. Uh, Spinner just saying there was a uh, Financial Times article about China going green with solar there. So keep in mind there was an article over the weekend on the, in the Financial Times that could impact some of the Chinese stocks, the solar stocks as well. So thanks, Spinner, for bringing that to our attention. Uh, Barons, Joe, was there anything uh, in the Barons that you know, I know you said Bogle was on the t- the front the cover there? Was there anything else that uh, jumped out at you? Uh, the thing that jumped out to me the most uh, was Coke and Pepsi. Uh, Coke and Pepsi. Yep. Yep. They were saying they, they, they were cheap, didn't they? Yep. Say they were cheap or something? Yep. Yep. And or uh, both trading higher. Yeah. And uh, Pepsi had a, had the analyst move on Thursday. That worked out pretty good. Uh, trading up another 22 cents in the pre market. What we got to keep an eye on is there a ton of size at 42.50. You had uh, four highs Probably. in that area. Got to, can, can you see that far in the book? I'll go analyst? look. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go look right now. All right. And while we're doing that, uh, Pepsi. Uh, beaten up a little bit too. Uh, this one rounding bottom here. Uh, this is uh, could be clearing resistance too. Uh, ninety eight twenty six was your high on May eleventh. Ninety eight forty five yesterday. So this one's waking up. You're looking for a uh, a uh, a trade, a swing trade. You could always stop out at the low of the move. Uh, Procter and Gamble was mentioned favorably as well. Yep. Uh, that is kind of that kind of maybe has a head and shoulders bottom here. I think we mentioned 74 on uh, Friday, 7407 was your high. So three days in a row, you made high at 74. That's your level. Uh, they also gave some love to Roku, uh, you know, saying that's the TV of the future. I don't know. I'm having, I don't watch that much TV, so I don't know if I can get on board on that one. But that's trading up a buck. I kind of like the Roku. You do? I don't know. Yeah, and I'm not from a fundamental. I haven't sat there and crunched the numbers, and maybe I got to do that. But I, I just, we know if these things go, this is how it goes. You know, the Roku is hot, it's hot for a bit, IPO. It cooled off, but it's starting to look kind of itchy a little bit on the chart again. Doesn't it look a little bit, you know, like it's itching to go? It does. Like here you are, 36.45 is trading up on this you know, Barron's article. Maybe you get a pullback to 36, but this kind of looks like it wants to run to 40 to me. Yeah, and it's had a long rounding bottom here, consolidation. Yeah. Uh, I think it maybe came off. It looks like it's turning. Yeah, 38.84. I mean, if you're really looking for the only resistance number up above here, 38.84 was your high on May 10th. Uh, They gave a little love to Lowe's, Lowe's as well. Uh, You know, saying, hey, it's going to catch up with Home Depot eventually. I don't know. I kind of say stick with the winners in this one, but uh, you got low straightening up a buck 53 folks here. And, yeah. Uh, one. That was an odd lot. Oh, really? Paint a little tape there. Yeah. Paint a little tape or somebody too overly excited. It was 28 shares trading up at 87, 87. So it was already offered back down. So I don't get too excited. Already offered back down 87, 19. Nobody's lifting that offer is bid at 86, 60. You're trading up 
0.59%, maybe trades up 1% on this. So I'd say, you know, fair value of that, maybe 87 bucks. Uh, Dennis, uh, let's you know, define that term. I mean, we use it a lot, painting the tape. It's uh, not a word you see a lot on CNBC or some of these other. Uh, it, 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 it happens. In this case, it's probably just some excited retail trader because it's 28 shares. And they probably, if you're paying the tape, you'd probably do it with 100 shares. So it hits everybody's, uh, like it changes the price and the consolidated and everything. So it's probably just in this case, probably just an, uh, you know, a smaller retail trader got excited, read the Barron's article and bought the thing as soon as they could at seven o'clock this morning, you know, when edge opened up and, you know, retail, um, uh, some of the retail brokers open up at seven o'clock too. Not all of them allow you to trade from the 4 a.m. open. So I'd assume it's just somebody got overly excited and that's not, not paying the tape. But what happens in some cases is you have like a report. And people don't know if it's good or bad. Well, you know what? If it's like you think you have a huge position and it's wishy-washy, sometimes you'll have institutional action saying, look, I think it's going higher. And they'll buy up a few hundred shares, just buy it up and saying they're making their point. And you can sometimes call that painting the tape. Is it, are they doing it intentionally to try to drive the price higher? I mean, that's a gray area. If you're doing it intentionally to drive the price higher, regulators might actually have a problem with that. And that's why I think where the classic definition of painting the tape comes, you think it has a devious activity. Some of it is just giving an opinion. Some of it is actually devious activity trying to drive the price higher. Um, if you got a couple million shares, I think even Jim Cramer has talked about that before. Let's say you had 20, $30 million worth of stock. Well, you, for a couple, you know, for 100,000 worth of stock, you can probably drive it up if there's no action in the pre-market or after hours. And that gets everybody talking. It gets the media buzzing. Oh, it's trading up here now. I think a lot of that maybe does happen, but you know, it's hard to just, you know, figure out what a trader's intentions are, um, you know, and if it's, if it's a devious or not, but that's what you know, painting the tape basically is. It's somebody driving the stock higher or, or buying up a, you know, a couple hundred shares or a few hundred shares, trying to get those prices higher to get a buzz going. That's the classic definition of painting the tape, which is gray and possibly illegal, but probably very hard to prove. Uh, just coming out of the YouTube chat, uh, another stock that perhaps being affected by this uh, China news, uh, ACIA. Now, that got the big pop last Monday, remember, when uh, uh, there was more chatter, and that was quickly faded. Um, yeah, 37, did. 37. Now it's kind of like deja vu all over again. That uh, You know, we're getting a pop. It's on the news. Let's see. There's really not a ton trading here. It's trading up a buck and a quarter. Um, I'm looking at the daily highs. We are clearing the 3350 area. So as long as you stay above 3350, I think you might be able to get some upside. But uh, a lot of the people that missed, uh, you know, selling between 34 and then that high last Monday at 3736. Um, I don't know. I would like to see this one open up higher and just keep churning higher. Um, if not, it could look for a fade. And if you take out uh, $32, 3212, uh, you're in jeopardy. Yeah, you got a gap fill. I guess it's not too bad. Thirty-one ninety-one is a gap fill. So if you're trying to buy down the cheap thirty-two, but you want to see this rally continue, and uh, I don't know, no shot at uh, getting that thirty-seven thirty-six high, but getting a pop off the China news. Uh, before we go to our our first guest, um, also uh, in the Google chat, uh, J Mister A is asking about AMD, Dennis. And man, are you, are you almost even off on that the races. thing? Huh? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm up in it now. I sold half of it. I think I'm in from the 12s. I'd have to look, but I've been somewhere. And obviously, you know, it came down afterwards and it popped back up. I sold half of it. I should have sold it all. Then it really tanked in April and I was kicking myself. Now it's all the way back up here again. I will say now is if you're coming in here now, wow, late to the party. And look at all those tops that we have from 2017 and the 14 handle. I think it gets up to that 14 handle. I think it probably struggles there again. So I feel like if you're coming here now, 1322, yes, there is room to 14. Yes, it, you have the wind in your sails right now because the thing is hot here again. Yes, the near-term trend is your friend, but it's starting to get a little bit frothy and overhead supply is going to happen when you start getting near 14. So I feel like you're in the late innings on the AMD rally. I'll say it's in the eighth inning. I think it could go to 14, which would put you in the ninth inning, but I don't think it's got more, much more gas than that. So I feel like if you're coming here now, you're chasing a bet. Here I am talking against my own investment book again. I'm the only guy, I think, in any media that talks against their book more than they talk with their book. But anyways, I have AMD. 
I'm probably going to stick at smaller position. I'll probably stick with it, but I think there's overhead supply coming at 14. At 1384, 1385, that was your January and February highs. Just, I don't know, something happening. Uh, we have a Micron, we have WD, uh, WDC trading up. I'm not really sure. Uh, it could be on. A lot of this is just Micron SP related. Be- Micron's trading up all because of Investor Day. Right, right. So right. it's Investor Day. And these things guidance. are slam dunks. You buy guidance. these things ahead of the day and sell it before it starts because you don't know what they're going to say maybe say something they don't like but it seems like whenever you're buying these things ahead of their investor days you make money so if you're buying micron have the investor day, buy it Friday. You turn around, you saw it right now. Micron, already up three and a half percent. Micron gave guidance uh, uh, at their investor day Q3 EPS. Well, they already have. Was yeah, investor, they gave, what time? It's already started. Holy cow! Yeah, starts early. yeah, they gave guidance and it was really good. Uh, Q3 EPS guidance, a uh, higher by like thirty cents. Sales guidance for the quarter. Uh, also higher than the estimates, so uh, good guidance for Micro on this one, and that could be driving uh, up the. Uh, this that second, helps the all of them too, morning. for sure. That's okay. all help in, all, the whole sector. So good call there, Spencer. All right, eight thirty six. Now we're a minute late for our, our guest for, for the day. We're going to take a quick break while we grab Kirk Duplessis, founder and head trader at Option Alpha. We'll be right back on Pre Market Prep. Welcome back, everyone. Pre-market prep, Spencer Israel, Joy O'Conn, and Dennis Dick on now with Kirk Duplessis, head trader and founder at Option Alpha. Kirk, how's it going this morning? Good, man. How are you guys doing? Uh, you were just telling us quickly during that break that you just had a kid. So why are you <laughs> why are you trading? <laughs> well, that the purpose is to, to be at home with the kids. Like I have like the rocker in the office now. So like he takes naps in here. But yeah, he's only a week old. So uh, so it's been a change for us. Number three. So We'll see what happens. So I, my uh, my brother-in-law has got an algorithm for this. He says, when you have one kid, it's hard. When you have the second kid, it's three times harder. When you have the third kid, it's 10 times harder. Exponential. Said, it's exponential. Yeah, yeah, it's exponential. Well, so, 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 so I only have two, so I only know the three times harder. Yeah. I can't imagine having the third kid, though. Someone else called it. They said, well, we have a boy now. We have two girls and then a boy. And someone else said it's an 18-year leap option contract that we have. So after 18 years, we're good, though. That's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hey, Tough, enjoy yeah. it. Enjoy it, man. It's and, fun. And the little it's fun. ones. Yeah. Wait, wait till you start, uh, you know, paying some bills and some college and things like that. That's and, right. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we got a boy. You know, like three weddings. If we had three girls, would have been surprising. So that would have been that would have been a drawdown for sure. All right. So uh, let's move on to the markets. And we, I think we've had you on a little bit over a year or so. Um, yep. And you know, originally you're like, you know, I'm just waiting for the volatility you know, to pick up if I'm not, you know, doing as, you know, doing great. I know the volatility is going to pick up and then, you know, there's different strategies that I can employ. Well, we got the volatility and it didn't last very long. So <laughs> it was fleeting. So, yeah. Yeah. Fleeting. So now like, when do you, like, how do you flip the switch? When do you, you know, flip the switch back? You know, cause our, our average trading range is already coming back down again, well under yep. 30. Like, is it something that like your PL tells you? Is it something that the market tells you? How to know when to make, you know, the transition, you know, from the high vol? I mean, obviously you can look at that, you know, the uh, the Greeks and that could tell you as well, but tell us what you use for clues. Yeah, well, I think it's just as simple as using implied volatility and then you can use IV percentiles or IV rank for stocks. So like we're not day traders. So we look at more of like position type trades. Um, but, you know, my like th- feeling on this is like, there's always something that's in favor with volatility, right? So like the spike that we had in February and March, 
that was great. And, you know, everything was on, on board basically, but now we have to kind of be picky and choosy. Right. So things that are now spiking up a little bit in volatility, like over the last month or so is like things like RSX, which is a Russian ETF, like that had a huge spike in volatility. That was great. Right. Now you've got other things like the Euro is actually spiking up a little bit. You got all these um, emerging markets like EWW, which is Mexico. So for me, it's just kind of choosing the low hanging fruit from that. Right. So I look backwards on my list and say, okay, what's highest implied volatility right now? It may not be the highest that we've seen all year, but what's the low hanging fruit that I can go after and then start picking and choosing from that. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's just move on here to uh, what is on your radar this morning. I mean, if you, yeah. were, if you were bullish Friday, even though what, <laughs> it was just a blah session, we had a 10 point interday range and you know, you did your levels. You I did WM did good though. Yeah. I mean, that was a good, that would have been a good one. Which one? Oh, I was going to say the Russell did great last week. You're it seemed right. like it was the only one that was up. Right, right. So uh, what's on your radar for today? I mean, if you were bullish Friday, you didn't take it home. And now, you know, now we're trading up 16 handles near the high of the trading range here. So uh, are there any issues that perhaps maybe you've underperformed at this point that uh, may pick up uh, if the rally continues? Yeah, you know, I think like, I think, you know, market wise, I think, the path of least resistance is still probably higher at this point, right? I mean, futures look like we're going to open higher. I think, you know, the interesting ones for me are oil and like the energy related sectors. So if you look at like where the dollar is, the dollar has been insanely strong over the last couple of months and, um, or just like even the last month and a half or so. And it's ironic and interesting that a strong dollar also has strong oil prices, which we don't often see. Um, so I think even if there's a pullback in the dollar, which could happen, that oil prices might continue to go higher. So I'd be a little bit bullish still on oil at this point. And uh, what Any if, specific stocks you're looking at in the oil sector? Because there's so many. I mean, yeah. you can go anywhere. Are you looking yeah, at anyone I, I specific? Like, no, I like the ETFs. I mean, I think you guys have heard me on, had me on before. I like the ETFs like XLE, OIH, XOP. Yep. Um, you know, pick your poison from those. But, uh, but yeah, I think if you're going to play some of those and they don't have an insanely low volatility. So I think it's it's an okay play to, you know, do like a bullish put spread or something like that. What about other sectors? Like we've had the financials here starting to show a little bit of life there a couple of weeks ago. Then they got slammed on Friday. Yeah. Um, are you looking at the banks here? Is this pullback as potential to maybe hop <laughs> in? Or is this something that you're seeing, seeing a trend break? What are your thoughts on the banks? I don't really care about the banks right now. I mean, to be totally honest with you, I think that uh, it's mid range for me. So like, it's not really, you know, like I look for something that's probably more of a tradable, you know, event. So something that's been overbought or, you know, something that's been really crushed down. Um, so for me, I look at things like, I think the Euro is interesting right now. I think FXE trading like a Euro ETF um, has just been hammered over the last month really and a half. Nice. Yeah. And um, so I look at that and I say, look, implied volatility in the euro and FXE is, you know, much higher than it's been the last year and a half. And so why not make a, you know, directional trade or neutral trade there? So I kind of like the euro, uh, dollar, oil related commodities right now. Talk about your trading style here. So are you looking at the FXE as a continuation trade, like trend break? This could continue to get lower, like from a momentum standpoint, or are you looking more from a yeah. contrarian standpoint where you yeah. can speed up too much? I, you know, I think it's probably been beat up too much, at least for the current move, right? Not that it couldn't yeah. move down in the future, but I think at least right now, I mean, it started to go parabolically down, right? And we know that yeah, that could really never did. happen. Um, so I look forward to move generally sideways to maybe, you know, higher up. So, you know, the euro is kind of interesting where it seems like over the last like two years, it trades in these like quick spurts and then ranges, right? So it'll have a, a you know, lunge higher and then it'll trade sideways for three months and then move down on, you know, new news and new information, trade sideways for another month or two. So, I think a little bit of a sideways action here is probably more in line of what's going to happen. I mean, what's interesting here is you look at those European banks here and they've started to go into the gutter here again. <laughs> and uh, Deutsche Bank, which looked like it had life at the beginning of the year, got over $19. It's back, back under 13 bucks here again. I mean, a little bit to do maybe with the currency exchange, but it's still, that's a huge move down here for Deutsche Bank now. Yeah. Yeah. My alma mater, I know it's getting crushed. So thank God I know, don't have any stock in it. <laughs> <laughs> what about the tech stocks? We've seen, you know, a lot of money flying back and we can go to the big guns here and look at the Facebooks mm -hmm. and the Amazons and the Netflix. They've cooled for, you know, a, a couple of days here, but um, really, you know, Facebook's come all the way back 
from its data breach stuff. Yep. Um, you can look at a Twitter and it's kind of just some consolidation station and come back a long ways as well. The Amazon and Netflix are all back from their lows that we had back in April there. Google as well has come off its lows as well. Is there an opportunity here for these to continue higher? What are your thoughts here on the techs? I think tech, is, the path of least resistance is higher, right? It's easy to say, you know, like when everything was in the, the spotlight about privacy and all this regulation stuff, it seems like that's back burner to now trade negotiations, trade war, or no trade war now is the new news. So I think as long as tech is out of the spotlight, then the path of least resistance is higher. So um, if you're going to trade those, I trade them higher. Is there any specific stocks you like? You're still sticking with this the ETFs. Yeah, so. I think. I mean, I think Facebook's had a huge move. I think people are going to start taking money off the table, right? I mean, it's basically now you know moved sideways from say October, November of last year, right? So anyone who held Facebook, assuming all these huge gains, which you know there's people out there that are just like Facebook fanatics and crazy about the stock. Well, they saw their portfolio basically go down to 150 and then all the way back up there. I think they're going to start taking money off the table. So I like the likes of, you know, Apple and and uh, and those types. Uh, Tesla, I don't know. I mean, Tesla seems like a dog already. It's it's trailing everyone else. So I would say Apple's probably the favorite there. Is Apple going to be the first one to a trillion? We'll see. I don't know. I think <laughs> it could easily be. Uh, Kirk, how do you go about trading specifically a, a headline like this trade war stuff that's just evolving day after day, week after week, and we're never really sure what's what's going to happen there? How do you go about trading, you know, a news catalyst like that? I don't I, honestly like I don't care that much. I, I realize that it's there. So um, like my opinion on all the news stuff is like be aware of it. So like keep your head on a swivel. You should know generally what's happening. But if that news hits the media, it's already been priced in, you know, for the most part. Um, I think that what's interesting is like if you look at Friday for the S&P, there's a lot of news about all this deal stuff that came out with China saying that they were going to, you know, reduce the deficit, right? Like that was the huge, the trade deficit. They were going to, you know, cut it by what was like $200 billion or something like that. But even still, like everyone thought that was going to be a hugely bullish event, but it wasn't, right? So it was buy the rumor, sell the news type of event. So for me, I think the reaction to the market's reaction is never always what we expect, right? We might expect that the market's always going to be favorable reacting to it, and it's not. Or we might expect the market's going to crush stocks on this news, and it doesn't, right? So I don't really like trade off of the news in, in that sense. So um, yeah, if okay. that helps out. Uh, I just got one more for you. Um, sure. Gold. Yeah, since you kind of like, uh, you know, you seem like you're in a contrarian mood today here. Uh, gold, uh, no fear in the market, stalled at 1350, lost 1300, mm -hmm. and now, uh, you know, trading 128450. Are you waiting for some uh, stabilization here, or are you just, uh, are you just buying Bitcoin instead? <laughs> no, no, definitely not buying Bitcoin instead. But I think gold. So we traded gold. We traded gold bearish last uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago or something like that. As it started to kind of break down, I think gold's been just like absolutely hammered down. But I still think it has some room to go because it's just failed at thirteen hundred so much that it just seems like it's never going to break through that level. Or it needs a really big catalyst to do it. So. Actually, I would not take the contrarian view on gold right now. I think gold is probably going to stay lower or head lower. All right. Kirk Duplessis has been on the line with us. He is the uh, founder and head trader at Option Alpha. Kirk, thanks so much for the time this morning and uh, get some rest if it, as, if it is at all possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Kirk. 8.48 now. Joel, where are we at in the markets? Uh, we're just hanging out here, up 15 and a quarter. One of those quiet sessions here, pre-market, your big jump up. Uh, bulls not taking profits yet. Uh, bears not ready to you know, make a stand yet here. Uh, Dennis is uh, mentioning the Euro banks here. And uh, Italy, Italy is, I think they have some elections going on over there today, don't they? Uh, so you know, we'll see if the European drinks, but, uh, banks may be a little bit uh, of a you know a negative effect on the market today, but you wonder when it starts to become a headline again because when Deutsche Bank and I'm going to the German bank obviously, but I just look at that DB chart and think about back in 2016 how many worries we had about Deutsche Bank. They were talking that on CNBC every single morning. Deutsche Bank down from 15 to 14, got down to 11 bucks, and then you know it came back in 20 and 20 dollars in 2017. It's quietly starting to look ugly here again. And if it starts falling down, getting to words single digits, it We'll start to grab headlines there again too so there's a new thing for you to worry about here again because there's something going on here with deutsche bank i mean the other european banks are weak yes 
ING does not look great. It's breaking down to a 52-week low here as well. You can look over at Barclays, big London bank. It's starting to roll over there. Banco Santander is a mess, which is SAN. But nothing seems as messy, really, and nothing's quite as widely followed over there as Deutsche Bank. So I start to worry here if DB continues down. And maybe there's some currency effects here, but it's not as you know, it's not 50% currency effects when the stock falls, you know, 33% here over the course of the last three months because, you know, we didn't move that much on the euro. But, you know, it's still, you look at this, it's going to start becoming a headline here eventually if it continues to sink there. So there is that potential catalyst for the market to worry about because that was significant. Back in 2016, they were worried about Deutsche Bank and, you know, is what if we know we go into another financial crisis over in Europe? You know, there. so here we are again. You know, our, our, our financials look pretty good, but I'll tell you, over in Europe, they're not looking nearly as good as they were three months ago. All right, Dennis, you're gonna, we're going to test your metal here. Uh, the Micron, uh, up guidance substantially, God, 284, 312 to 316, uh, sales higher Great call as by Spencer well too. here, uh, 56.44. Uh, that was your high for Friday. We may see that, 56.91. I uh, was your high on Thursday. I didn't think we'd get there, but here we are. Let's see if we could hit Friday's high in Micron. Yeah, I should, you know, and I had the whole game plan was buying more at 50. I never did. I should be, you know, kick myself in the butt for that because I need, you know, I, I wanted more stock in my best portfolio. I obviously, you know, have some stock, but I wanted to have more and I didn't do it. And, you know, I, I bought some different stocks and some of them have actually done pretty good. So it's not like the money is just sitting there. I kind of just put it in different stocks, but. That being said, I did want more Micron. I didn't do it, so I am kicking myself here now because the thing is off to the races here. Um, I was on the record saying I think this thing could, you know, we had four or five analysts uh, saying this is going to 100 bucks. I was like, I, I think it's possible. You know, I wasn't coming out saying it's $100, but it's like, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility here. I still think Micron could be significantly higher here by the end of the year. So I like it on pullbacks. I'm not chasing it here this morning. It has not paid to chase Micron. I already did it once chasing it, and I'm not chasing it. But I'll say on pullbacks here, I still like Micron. Uh, getting a pop here in Sears Holding. Uh, did get a pop up to 415 back under four. What's going on Sears? Sears and City extend their credit card relationship. City to pay Sears uh, $425 million. And you know they need some cash here. Hey, cash. So, yeah, it's trying. Uh, that spike high that you had a few uh, days ago was to 408. You got to 415 in the pre market. Some decent volume trading here. So, I don't know. I, I think it's, uh, you know, from a from a technical perspective, and that's really the only way you can talk about Sears here. You know, get up above four, close above four dollars, and maybe you know embark on going to five here. But uh, so far, that early pop into the four dollar handle uh, was quickly faded. You you could squeeze the shorts here a little bit, but I'll tell you, if you give me the European option there i'm buying puts not buying calls on sears i think sears one year from now is lower than three dollars and 98 cents so yeah you're gonna have little painful short squeezes in there but i still think the road to sears for for jc penny and sears i still think we're kind of on the road to zero on both of those so i want nothing to do long term with either of these companies dillard's here spinner uh pointing out we haven't done ratings yet so maybe we could do that right now uh getting an upgrade bank of america here today uh good earnings when i was away i believe they reported some decent numbers there. Uh, DDS, how were the numbers there, Spencer? Uh, and, uh, they were Thursday, Thursday morning, and they yeah, two, yeah. 289 versus 277 on the EPS, and the sales was uh, was was a slight miss. So nothing, nothing crazy. You're getting a pop. A lot of the bigger, you know, uh, department stores. Dillard's compares well to a Macy's. Compares well to the Kohl's. Compares well to the Nordstrom. We know Nordstrom got hit on their report. Macy's rallied on their reports. They had one going up, one going down. Now you got Dillard's going, you know, up on their report. They get the upgrade this morning. They are getting a lift here. I, if I'm playing Dillard's, I still like the DDT. I'm going to say it. I had in my invest portfolio for a long time. I finally got rid of it out of there. And the main reason was is just that Dillard's had come down a little bit, but it's kind of going back up here now. I don't know why they don't, you know, call this, uh, call this capital trust in because it's paying seven and a half percent. And I would think Dillard's could get money cheaper than that. I think it's, you know, a, a miss. I think it's mismanagement to be honest with you that they don't call it in, but that DDT paying you seven and a half percent, where do you get that money when the stock's trading at 80? It's telling me it's safe. So I still like DDT here. Um, the downside, you buy a 25, 47. I mean, they could call it in tomorrow. But usually you have a leeway. You really, I don't see a lot of, you know, 
huge downside here because I don't think it's going to trade much under 25 unless Dillard's DDS really starts to go into the gutter. And we're not seeing that right now. So as of right now, DDT looks like a nice, safe preferred stock. I know we were talking preferreds earlier this morning. You want a seven and a half at 7.36% yield right now. It's trading a little bit above par, but 25.47, not a bad price on DDT. Yeah. Um, one, I was thinking of this one and when you got out of uh, your preferred and it was getting beat up pretty good. And I was looking at this one and the Which thing one? that kind of stuck out of my mind was, you know, where, where it's located. And um, a lot of the stores, the malls. yeah, well, it's in the malls, but um, they're headquartered in Little Rock, Arkansas. They got a bunch of stores in Texas, you know, and just that region of the country, you know, Texas is of all the states. I mean, you know, with the way oil has been cranking and everything, you know, that part of the country, you know, I don't not say it's immune to everything that's going on, but definitely have, you know, in good shape as far as Texas and Arkansas and the oil country. So that's one that's one uh, positive thing going forward here. Uh, I want to do one comparison for you sure. here and just ask even the chat what they think. Sure. But here you got Dillard's and their capital trust security, DDT, 7.36% dividend. Then you got Deutsche Bank, which has capital trust securities as well. DXB, yielding only 6.38%. Would you want to have your money in the DXB of Deutsche Bank, which we just talked about, we can see the stock going straight down. Or would you want to have it in a Dillard's of DDT where the stock is actually going up? Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, and you're getting 1% less in the DXB versus the DDT. Otherwise, they're basically completely comparable. They're both capital trust securities. They're both, you know, in a liquidation event going to be above the common shareholders there. But I think that DXB, I look at something like that. And there's another one out there too. There's DKT. I think those are screaming shorts, but. Um, you know, just with the, where Deutsche Bank is right now, it makes it scares the hell out of me to think that um, to, to you know, to, like I look at that DXB at six point three eight percent. Do you want to loan loan money to Deutsche Bank for six percent right now? <laughs> with the stock chart looking like that, no. Nope. I, I think I think this DXB could go into you know and and you know there's different catalysts here, interest rates, lots of other things. I don't think DB is at a liquidation event here yet, but where that chart is going is telling me there's risk. And that DXB is pricing in zero risk. So I know it's, it's even ex-dividend here today, actually, right now, and was trading up in the pre-market because somebody maybe didn't realize it went ex-dividend. But I, I think that DXB is a short. You got to watch the cost to borrow. It might be high. So uh, it might not be that easy to do. Tesla Motors uh, getting, a, I believe, getting an upgrade here, uh, trading up in the pre-market $4.44. Uh, just kind of hanging out here in really the middle of the nowhere, but I could, let me find a level for you here. We went to upgrade it. We got an upgrade. I think so. Let me, um, I thought Spencer, so. what was, uh, I didn't see that one. Do we see that? Uh, stock dude. Uh, you could be you, right. Mm -hmm. I maybe I missed know, it. Market logic. I don't know. I didn't see I'm trying to look too. I, I didn't notice this one, but maybe I'm just trying to look through my, my, uh, news wire there too. I didn't see an upgrade. Oh, somebody raised price target. Raised price target. Uh, it hit some nice support here uh, at the. He had a couple lows around two seventy five, trading up in the pre market, but just not really running. I mean, we're up about four seventy eight. Some of that could be sympathy with the market. Uh, look at the, your daily charts here. Let's see what happens. Let's see if we can get the Friday's high eighty four sixty five. Thursday's close was right there at 84.54. So actually Tesla opened up at the high of the day on Friday. So still another couple bucks to run. We'd really like to see it clear Friday's high slash Thursday's close area. This price target raised up Berenberg to 500 bucks. That's what it was. Oh boy, better run out and get it now under 300. <laughs> Do you want to it's run? a little bit of a lofty price target in my opinion. Do you want to run through the rest of the ratings? There weren't that many this morning. You mentioned Dillard's. Uh, as far as upgrades though, with Snapchat. Yep. Snapchat catching an upgrade uh, at Moffat Nathanson from sell to neutral. That was the other big one that I saw. Was there any Campbell's upgrades? downgrade underperform yeah. at Bank of America? Yeah, and man, I tell you, I swore on the show on you Wednesday did. and I said, and I was right on that call though. I said, I wanted <laughs> to sell my crap lines. You kind of talked me out of it. Oh, yeah. I was going to eat the dollar. I was like going to move on and eat the dollar. The thing was at 5920. I was like, you know what? This looks like it's failing at 60 to me. It looks like it's going to start going down. And I said, doesn't it make you want to hit the blank out of it? That was 59.20 bid. It's now 56.79. It got cambled. 
because Campbell's came out and now knocked every food stock down. I mean, CPB is an absolute disaster now. Um, we're talking here a stock that was already in the gutter, falling another five points on Friday on a disappointing earnings report from, I believe it was Thursday night. So when I was away, food stocks are now even more out of favor. I mean, they got interest rates working against them. Eventually, there is some value. I don't think Campbell's Soup is going out of business, guys. But I tell you, they are so out of favor now. I think Campbell's Soup could see 30 bucks here eventually. And uh, the classic that Kraft Heinz you know, had that major support at 60. You broke down. And then it came right That was my back. argument. Yeah, it was. That's I, why I was going to sell out of the invest portfolio because I thought I'm going to get it cheaper. Yeah. But I guess I'm sticking with it now. I missed the out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. 60 bucks, major level on that. Uh, boom, boom. Uh, real quick, uh, KSS and uh, TJX, uh, they, I think they have earnings tomorrow. I don't know. Mixed reaction to the earnings here. If you're playing it ahead of earnings, 65 is a key number here in Kohl's. You got a double top at 64, 89, and 99. On the downside, hmm, loose range, but 62 is support. And TGX, which always seems to beat uh, this it's stock. The pass. Yeah, always gets a pass. It always does. Uh, good support at 84 and a half. Have two lows there. Coming back on the upside, um, sellers at 86.04 on Friday. Thursday's close was 86.27, so some work to do in the 86 handles. Spencer, yeah, it's going to be it us for it's going to it's going to be it for us this morning. Well, can't talk, but uh, if you want to catch our podcast, I, can't either. I just did a whole show, Spencer, and I'm like <laughs> so tired, well, being stuck in the terminal up. for so long. I don't drink that heavy and, you know, I'm with these young bucks and they're trying to, you know, give you beers and shots. And I was like, I, I never do shots of liquor. And I'm like, oh, but you're at a bachelor party. What are you going to do? My younger brother got married and I'm hurting today, guys. You can look at me. I'm hurt. Your brother. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you, you know, it's painful. Probably doesn't listening even know to who's bachelor rough, party. Yeah, but you show. don't have a brother. He's you're the, an only child. Doesn't even know. My what brother-in-law. <laughs> Listen, my brother. I don't even. Yeah. Brother-in-law. My brother-in-law. And uh, did you catch the Preakness? Uh, no. Who won? Uh, Justify won. Uh, Didn't Justify win last year? Yeah. No. No, no the Derby. The, the Derby. <laughs> the, he, oh. <laughs> oh, boy. You know how much I follow horse races. <laughs> Man, okay. All right, so Anyways, you, got, you got the Triple Crown coming. Is you that got what you're the Triple me? Crown coming. Justify won. Uh, alerted our traders, investors, that there were some nice uh, exact bets out there. And the one-two combination... Uh, paid twenty seven seventy. Uh, if you had justify with uh, Bravazzo, ah. so I had that made a little money over the weekend. Oh, I, you had it. Yep, I had the exacta. Cool. Yep, I didn't even, I didn't even box it. I just went straight up because he looks good. So, all he right. Knows these horses. I tell you, Joel knows horses. All right, all righty, folks. So that's that's our show for the day. Hope you guys had a good morning and you had a good rest of your day. And we hope you join us again. Uh, tomorrow, again, catch our podcast, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and tune in. Just search for pre-market prep on any of those platforms. So, again, have a good one, and we will see you folks on Tuesday.